Good evening, this is Dr. Lewis Foley, and we're going to go ahead and get started with our exam pro or board prep webinar for Tuesday, August 31st, 2021. Tonight's going to be a caseless defense type of webinar, and we are going to go ahead and get started after we go through the obligatory go to webinar control panel briefing. The little orange box with a white arrow allows you to collapse or expand the control panel so you can get it out of your view during the webinar. The upper portion of the control panel is for control of the audio portion of the webinar. This is very important. By default, the uh, software will choose the microphone and speakers from your computer. If you would like to use a telephone, which can be advantageous if you're in an area with a lot of background noise, click audio setup, use telephone. You'll be given a number to dial in an access code, and very important, an audio PIN number that must be entered in in order for me to be able to unmute you during the webinar. The bottom portion of the control panel we do not use, so please don't type any questions in here. I won't know that you did, but we do use the raise a hand feature. This is how you can volunteer uh, to either uh, get in the hot seat or if you have a question. And I will tell you that we do record all of our webinar sessions. If you need information about getting access to a recorded session, contact our exam pro staff and they can help you with that. So we're going to go ahead and get into the caseless defense practice webinar for tonight. I have shown this before, so I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I will tell you that today was the deadline for late submission of case lists. So I think 1159 tonight is the absolute last second if you haven't already submitted it. After that, it's about practice, practice mock orals, uh, you know, try to get up to doing one hour without feedback. And once you have submitted your case list, only work with the list that you submitted. All right, I'm going to stop this here and let me go ahead and get the uh, case list up and we will go ahead and do that. All right, so I am looking for volunteers. If anybody is interested in getting in the hot seat, if you will click the raise a hand feature. Dr. Pham, can I go to you first? Yes. All right. Do you have a preference which list I pull up? Uh, no. Okay. Have you been in the hot seat recently? Uh, I try to be, yeah. <laughs> do you, do, you know, this is great in August. There's not very many people on the webinars, so there's lots of time in the hot seat. Um, do you remember what you did last, which list you worked from last? I hate to always go to the same list for the same people over and over. Uh, last time it was office and the topic was um, preconception counseling. Okay, so I'll tell you what, how about if we go to OB? So we'll mix it okay. up a little bit. All right. And give me just one second. All right, let's talk about case number 32. Okay. So when you say incidental vasa previa, mm -hmm. are you indicating that the patient wasn't symptomatic? It was an ultrasound finding? Yes. Um, so the backstory is that she had a known low-lying placenta um, and she was being reevaluated with MFM for her low lying placenta. And at that time, um, they saw the visa previa, but she did not have any bleeding. So, first question what is a visa previa? Um, a visa pre previa is a um, where you've got a vessel overlying the os, a blood vessel overlying the os. Okay, so how is a vasa previa different from a placenta previa? A placenta previa is where the placenta is over the cervical os. Okay, so this is like a blood vessel that goes to the placenta, but it's not in placental tissue? Um, 
yes, it's it's like a blood vessel from the placenta coursing over the cervix, um, but kind of standalone and not being, I guess, protected by the placenta or surrounded by the placenta. Now, if the patient had a placenta previa, the recommendation would be for a cesarean delivery, correct? Yes. So with a vasa previa, how does it differ? Um, in terms of delivery? In terms of uh, manage okay. management, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it is very similar to a um, placenta previa in the sense that um, you want to deliver via a cesarean delivery. If the patient goes into labor, um, then there is significant risk of bleeding, um, leading to maternal and potential fetal hemorrhage and um, morbidity and mortality from that. Um, I guess in terms of difference, um, I think the management is fairly similar in, in the sense that like you, would move very, if like you want the patient, you would give the patient precautions about um, contractions and if there were any signs of bleeding, you would want to, the patient to follow up with you as soon as possible. Um, yeah, I think they're managed very similarly. Now, did you deliver at 36 weeks because of the vasa previa or was it for other reasons? Um, the yes, uh, it was because of the Vesa Previa uh, per um, MFM recommendations. Um, she, the MFM doctor, did the ultrasound, saw the incidental Vesa Previa, and that, in combination with the borderline low amniotic fluid, um, she recommended immediate delivery via cesarean section. Okay. So the vasa previa is actually discovered at the time of admission, right before she, the patient was admitted for delivery. Yes. All right. Is a vasa previa something that is likely to recur in a future pregnancy? Um, that is something that I would have to look up, but I would guess um, no. All right, and uh, when you did the delivery, did you find anything interesting? Um, the placenta look, was sent to the pathology um, and nothing kind of significant came back other than like the way the placenta looked was really raggedy and unhealthy looking. Um, but it's also my understanding that uh, visa previas are kind of hard to identify on pathology as well. Okay, so um, I'll just stop here for a second. So the thing about that I think about with Vesa Previa that's different from Placenta Previa is the source of the bleeding. So if, okay. you, if the patient goes into labor and breaks her water, the concern is that you'll get a tear into those Vesa Previa vessels, which are fetal blood, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, as opposed to a placenta previa, where you're worried about detachment of the placenta from the uterine surface, which is mainly going to be maternal blood, but it's going to affect fetal oxygenation, okay? Mm -hmm. um, in both cases, it's going to be a cesarean delivery done early, like you did here. Um, what I think about with vasa previa is basically you have the blood vessels that would accompany the fetal surface of the placenta kind of running in the membranes without uh, underlying placental tissue. And that's what makes them so fragile and susceptible to being ruptured. I don't think there is any recurrence risk for a vasa previa. Um, I would have to double check and make sure that hasn't changed, but my recollection on that is there is no recurrence risk there. Um, generally speaking, I would think this would probably be about as far as the patient would go in pregnancy, around 36 weeks, um, and perhaps even be delivered a little bit earlier, depending upon the scenario. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else of interest about it. Um, those are the, the main thoughts. I mean, it's absolutely, it looks like the right decision. Uh, and oh, you said that in pathology, I think it can be difficult in pathology, um, you know, especially because when you deliver, you disrupt the amniotic membranes and potentially the relationship can be hard to identify. 
especially if it was only, uh, you know, an isolated vessel or a few vessels, it may be difficult to identify. Uh, I agree with that totally. Uh, I'm just thinking if there's anything else. So for the future pregnancy, because you did a low transverse cesarean delivery and this was her first one for a future pregnancy, I assume you would offer a patient a trial of labor. Yes. Good. And those are really the key things. Any questions for me about this? No, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to let you have the hot seat. And, you know, this went pretty quick. Maybe we'll get back to you again before the end of the night because, like I said, there's not a lot of people in August in the webinars, okay? Sounds good. All right. Let me just mute you again. And then I'm going to get the next person in the hot seat and grab the next list. Dr. Benda, are you there? Hello. Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can I go to you next? Absolutely. And do you have a preference which list we look at? Uh, let's go with GYN. All right. Now I'm going to try to scroll down. I'm always afraid that we'll only be focusing on the first few cases on a list. <laughs> so I try to try to scroll down and make sure we didn't miss anything good. Okay, so I'm interested. It looks like, if I'm seeing this correctly, there are only two hysterectomies on your case list. Is that right? Correct. And they're both robotic. They are both from residency, so, actually. Oh, this is senior residency cases. Okay, yes. all right. I should, yeah, I should have noticed I know. that. I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't being thorough. Okay, all right. Um, now, did you get to choose which cases you put on here, right? I did, you know, because of COVID, I did not have um, the, the full panel of 20, 20 patients or whatever the, the minimum was. So I did um, pull, I think I only had six cases um, for the time period from uh, this past year. So I did pull the remainder from residency. Okay, so um, let's do this. Let's, Let's talk for a few seconds about hysterectomy. I'm not going to specifically, well, actually, yeah, we will specifically talk about, about case number 13 for, for a second. I'm going to use this as the okay. entry into the discussion of um, risks and complications. So here's my first question for you. You have two robotic hysterectomies on your case list, and they're from residency. And how far out of residency are you now? Is this your first year out? This is, I finished in 2019. So this is, I'm just starting like my second year. Okay, are you still doing hysterectomies or are you in a practice where you're mainly doing office and OB? So I've had an interesting uh, course where I um, was doing full panel, then COVID hit, then I my office was actually closed by the hospital. So since February, I have not been doing I had a, a lapse in my employment and I'm actually starting my new job tomorrow. Uh, but oh, okay. I, yeah, but so I did not have the opportunity between the time when I became employed, actually, I guess the time that case collection started and the time that I stopped working at that position, um, t we weren't doing, a his doing hysterectomies at one point and I, I didn't have one that came up that any patient totally that needed one. Yeah. Totally good, okay. And because of COVID, that really makes everything even more complex. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, let me ask you this first of all before we talk about case 13. Tell me, if you will, anything you can think of that increases the risk for complications during a hysterectomy. 
Oh, sure. So I would think um, complications specific to the patient, um, medical comorbidities, um, when you're, especially when you're looking at um, a, a laparoscopic approach or a laparoscopic assisted approach in this case, can she tolerate Trendelenburg? Um, there are many risk factors that make you less able to tolerate Trendelenburg. Um, uh, other risks um, could include, you know, the uterine pathology in and of itself. Is it a larger uterus? Are there lots of fibroids that would make it more difficult to see, more likely to um, have an injury happen? Uh, does she, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, has she had a previous abdominal surgical history? Does she have, um, or a history of endometriosis where the, um, actual you know appearance of the anatomy is going to be potentially distorted or have a lot of adhesions making a case that um, otherwise could be straightforward very much uh, more complicated um, other things um, you know that could make a patient more a surgery more likely to result in uh, complications um, besides the uterus itself, um, besides the uh, patient herself. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, obviously cancer, uh, cancer cases are, are typically seen as, as much more um, complicated, the patient's more prone to, uh, to you know, VTE, um, and these are um, much higher risk surgeries just by nature of the patient having cancer. Okay, tell me what are some of the complications associated with hysterectomy? So any surgery um, is subject to complications of anesthesia, bleeding, infection, and damage to surrounding organs. Um, for, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, bleeding and infection, you know, you run the risk of, um, you know, damage to the uterine arteries, difficulty controlling the bleeding there, um, infection, post-op infection, we give antibiotics for, but certainly if the patient has risk factors for wound infection, um, that certainly could um, increase that risk for the patient. Um, damage to surrounding organs, so kind of going along with, you know, possibly a more complicated uh, an anatomical abdomen if the patient has adhesions or history of endometriosis, scar tissue, um, certainly uh, risking damage to um, surrounding organs in the abdomen, so, so bowel and bladder as well. Okay, so you gave me four kind of you gave me you gave me four kind of general categories. You said infection, anesthesia, bleeding, and injury to other structures. Among those four categories, which one of those is most common for complication of hysterectomy? Infection, anesthesia, bleeding, or injury to other structures? I would say anis, um, injury to other structures is most common. Now you're making me question my, my, you would actually hope that that's not, but I, I feel like the risk of all of these things is so low. Um, so I, I think I would have to think about that a little bit more. Okay, let me ask you this. Case number 13, you mentioned small bowel adhesions, the anterior abdominal wall and uterus. So I'm assuming that this was not near the area of your initial trocar entry, which would probably have been at the umbilicus. Is that correct? Correct. This was just okay. um, caught at to it. Yes. Okay. okay. So describe to me if you begin a laparoscopic or robotic hysterectomy and you see some adhesions like you saw in this case, how you would proceed. So you, whatever point where you notice them, probably pretty early on, you see mm -hmm. them, now what would you do? Sure. So, um, so as I recall this case, um, the umbilical port was placed, um, and then of course this abdominal survey is done, looking both, um, you know, cephalad and caudad, and at this time the adhesions were recognized. Um, 
So uh, placement of lateral ports was accomplished um, under direct visualization. And then um, the, there, if I, as I recall, there were some filmy adhesions and those were taken down um, carefully uh, with uh, sharp cold scissors. Um, from there, some gentle uh, uh, gentle exploration of the further adhesions that appeared more dense was accomplished with um, blunt instruments, and um, it was determined that we were going to need some extra help to make sure that we uh, minimize this patient's risk uh, for damage to her bowel. So we did call in um, colorectal to assist us. All right. Uh, they were able to take down the adhesions or did they end up entering the bowel? Yeah, they were actually able to take down the adhesions. Um, and then um, they, of course, ran the bowel to see, you know, as, as, as I believe they always do and said that everything looked fine. And we were able to um, then go ahead and dock the robot and complete um, the hysterectomy. When you say they ran the bowel, what do you mean? So they um, looked at the bowel um, laparoscopically, so kind of um, moving it along from the from you know I don't remember if they started up top at, at the duodenum, but um, all all the way down to uh, um, the sigmoid to to assess for any further you know any bleeding or you know anything that they had lysed that was. Um, that could have needed so can a, you just, a primary can, repair. So can you can can you take me through the course of the bowel where you'd start and what the different sections of the bowel as you would go through running the bowel? So uh, these were small bowel adhesions. So so the duodenum at the ligament of trites, going to the jejunum and the ileum, uh, then the cecum, the uh, ascending, transverse, descending, colon, and the sigmoid colon in the rectum. Okay. How long is the small bowel? It is very long. If I recall, it's like 40 feet. <laughs> All right. And the duodenum. Can you actually inspect the duodenum? No, you can't. Why not? because it is, I believe it's, it's in a compartment where you, you, it's not where you can't see it. So I want to say it's like retroperitoneal. Okay. Um, now in this particular case, there were no complications. Did your post-operative management change in any way because of the enterolysis? That's a very good question. Um, you know, I think we were very lucky in that, um, you know, we had colorectal available. We were able to take the, or and colorectal was able to successfully release the adhesions without any trauma to the bowel, um, and um, they did not recommend any longer stay. Um, this particular attending did same day surgery for this, and um, you know, the the colorectal surgeon I think came back towards the end of the case, just kind of wanted to take a last look before. Um, before we released our new aperitoneum, and he said everything looked good. He didn't think anything else was necessary, and because the case had otherwise been unremarkable on our part as well, um, and the patient did great postoperatively in recovery, there uh, the patient did not need to stay another night. Or okay, I want to ask you I a hypothetical. I want to ask you a hypothetical question. Sure. If there had been a during the dissection by the colorectal surgeon, if there had been an injury to the small bowel that was immediately recognized and primarily repaired, would you anticipate the patient would need antibiotics? So, um, I think that whenever there's a, cons if it's a primary repair and they thought that you know, if it needed to be repaired in two layers, I would I would think that they would probably give antibiotics just as a precaution. Um, if it was something just like a, a serosal, a very superficial serosal thing where they put in a stitch just just cause, I don't think that 
as I recall, that typically they would add additional antibiotics. It's, you know, it's a hist, so we're already giving antibiotics to start. Ah, that's, that's an important point. So when we do a hysterectomy, we give antibiotics as a precaution, as you might say, which we call mm -hmm. prophylaxis, right? Prophylaxis, yes. Right? What antibiotic do yes. you usually give? You usually give ANSEF. Okay. When your general surgeon or colorectal surgeon does a planned procedure that involves operating on the bowel, they also give prophylactic antibiotics. Do you yes. have any idea what antibiotic they usually give? Yes, ertapenem is usually what they give. That's interesting because actually ANSEF would also be acceptable. Okay. Did you, did you know that? That is kind of, that is sounding more familiar, but yes. So, so the bottom line here where I'm going with this for everybody listening, if you have a, a small injury that is recognized immediately and it's primarily repaired without any other issues uh, and you gave prophylactic antibiotics for your case because this was a hysterectomy, then usually additional antibiotics are not required because the prophylaxis would have been similar to the prophylaxis that you gave. So in most cases, I would not anticipate additional antibiotics. It's a little different when you have a, you know, an injury that um, with delayed recognition or where the patient had not gotten prophylactic antibiotics because the case wasn't one that required prophylactic antibiotics. But in this case, I wouldn't expect anything different. I do want to mention um, for everybody listening, what we just talked about is a very important discussion. This running the bowel. So you did great. You talked about the ligament atrite. That's basically where the duodenum and the jejunum meet. The duodenum is retroperitoneal. The jejunum is intraperitoneal. So when we start our running of the bowel, whether it's open or laparoscopic, we usually start there. And we work our way through the jejunum and the ilium, which are the small bowel, which are as much as six meters in length. So, you know, you said 40 feet, that's not out of bounds. The small bowel is very long. That's the bottom line. Okay. That's a lot of bowel to look at, okay? And then of course the small bowel meets the large bowel at the cecum, and then you have the, as you said, ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, colon, and then the rectum. That is something that we should all be uh, comfortable describing. And for that matter, we should all at least be comfortable kind of attempting to run through that sequence. Uh, if you don't do it every day, doing it laparoscopically is much more difficult. Doing it open is a lot easier. And so I would tell you this, um, if you had a case where you were having difficulty running the bowel laparoscopically and there was no, no surgeon available to come help you, you might have to open a patient to do a good job running the bowel. If there was an injury and that's why you were running the bowel, it's probably worth it if that's what it requires. Um, and this gets into the whole thing. We all have different set of skills and, and different uh, assistants that are available to us. So the key point is that recognizing a bowel, in a bowel injury at the time of the original surgery is the most important point. If it requires a larger incision, so be it. Um, you did a great job with that. I want to review a couple other things. When we think about complications of hysterectomy, there's four broad classes you gave, infection, anesthesia, bleeding and injury to other structures. I would agree those are four of the most significant areas. If you look at the category, the most common is actually infection, which can okay. include so many things. You know, how many times do you get a little superficial cellulitis? That would count sure. as infection. Much more common than the others. Um, if you count it as a category, infection would be the most common. Um, looking at factors that increase the risk of complications. I like the way you initially laid out patient factors. Uh, you said, I think, medical comorbidities that might affect the surgery. I would also add surgeon factors, like the experience level of the surgeon, um, mm -hmm. distractions. Uh, distractions can come in a lot of different forms. This could be what we think of with music or conversation. It could also be a surgeon who's in a rush because they've got a lot of cases, they're under a lot of pressure. That can certainly be a distraction. In the medical contraindications uh, or medical risks of complications, excuse me, you mentioned Trendelenburg, you mentioned cancer. I would also mention medical conditions like hypertension and diabetes increase the risk for certain kind of complications from surgery as well. Um, you mentioned abnormal anatomy, and there are several different uh, subsets. 
That could be uterine size and shape. It could be adhesions from surgery or medical conditions like endometriosis. Or also abnormal anatomy could include non-gynecologic structures like, in this case, uh, adhesions between the small bowel. Uh, you could have an adnexal mass. You could have a hydrosalpink. You can have some disease process going on in the abdomen. It's not related to gynecology. Um, so again, lots of different things that increase the risk of complications. Um, so I'm just trying to think if there's anything else about this case. It looks like a pretty straightforward case and it looks like it turned out pretty well. So I think I'm gonna stop this discussion here. Any questions for me before I let you out of the hot seat? Um, so, um, as far as complications specific to hysterectomy, did I adequately answer the question or do you think that, Yo, is there more targeted? I think, you, I think you did, I think you did a good job, but I would not consider injury to other structures to be the most common yeah. uh, group. Yeah. Well, obviously it's going to be infection, but otherwise I thought you did okay. a good job. Yeah. Okay. All and right. I particularly, I, I want to say, I particularly like the fact that when you mentioned running the bowel and I asked you about it, you gave me a pretty good answer. You could take me through the bowel from the ligament of the trite to the, to the rectum. Surprisingly, a lot of us, this might be old, like medical school resident information we haven't thought of in a while. And I do run into people who struggle to give that progression. All of us should be able to describe that. Okay. Right. So All nice right. job. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep, I'm going to take you out of the hot seat here, and we'll get the next person up. Just one second. Dr. Jones, can I come to you next? How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Pretty good. All right, so which list would you like to look at? Um, either one. Um, I think I did Gyne or GYN um, last time I was in the hot seat. So either office or OB. Okay, I'll see what, how about if we go to office because we haven't looked at office tonight. Let me see what we have there. Hmm, okay. Um, <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about case number seven for just a second. Okay. So you um you are a risk taker, or you're you like REI? Um, neither. I'm <laughs> neither. <laughs> it's my patient population. Okay. <laughs> yes, but in the office list, and I know you, I know you oh, know I this because well, I, I think I mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. What'd you say? No, I understand what you're trying to say. Well, yeah, I I knew that I needed to learn it, so I just put it so on there. So case number seven, case number seven is the one I'm I'm looking at here. Primary infertility. I remember Dr. Shamroth years ago. He used to say, if you get a structured case on primary infertility in the exam, it is not your lucky day. Do not play the lottery, okay? <laughs> because it's not very often that they'll give you that, and it's a pretty hard discussion. So let's talk about this. Let's start for a second with how would you approach a differential diagnosis for primary infertility? Um, so I would first try to evaluate the patient um, history and physical to see if she's ever had any prior pregnancies or any issues with her menses in the past. Um, I would get a thorough history to see if she's had any prior um, infections that could be possibly the cause of her infertility. Um, as well as if she was on any current medications, et cetera. Okay. So I want to hear your differential diagnosis for primary infertility. Um, so initially, uh, I try to evaluate whether or not the patient is aware of how to conceive. And so I kind of go through that. Um, so that's just like an education. Um, when oh, you know what I have to tell you? We'd have to say something. Uh, Dr. Jones, I made a big mistake. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, you gotta forgive me. I'm so embarrassed. I'm gonna yeah. admit, when I read primary infertility, I, I saw the oligomenorrhea and I put the two together and I was thinking primary amenorrhea. Oh, ah, okay. like, yes. I <laughs> I mean, so we... uh, you probably thought I, this is the strangest question. So I'll tell you what, let's <laughs> talk about primary amenorrhea for just a second. 
Okay. Oh, great. Um, gosh, I, I can't, that's okay. It's okay. Uh, we'll get back to this case, but, uh, but I want to make the point because if any of you, I'm going to give you at the end of this discussion, a good way to think about it. If you don't give it to me before. So tell me if you're thinking about primary amenorrhea, and I'm so sorry I did this to you. If you're thinking about primary amenorrhea, <laughs> give me a differential diagnosis. I'm so sorry. I was totally focused on the wrong thing, but how would you, Give a differential diagnosis for primary amenorrhea. Um, so for primary amenorrhea, um, I'm thinking whether it is a structural cause or a genetic cause or um, physiologic, like a athlete's triad where a patient um, just hasn't had um, her menses as of yet. Okay, so give me some examples. For example, if it's a um, anatomy, she could have a. Um, and of course, my brain just went blank. Um, she can have an outflow tract an anomaly, where um, to cause the patient to not have menses. She could also have a congenital or um, genetic abnormality, where she has Turner syndrome or um, gonadogenital dysgenesis. Um, or she could also have some um, central anomaly relating to her pituitary or her, her hypothalamus as well. Okay. I'm going to give you a little strategy since okay. I got you into this. I okay? think I need a strategy. <laughs> for, no, no, Emily, we all do. I mean, for everybody listening, I want you to do the same thing. Dr. Jones, do you have a piece of paper here? I do. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to write breast slash uterus and then beneath these um, beneath each word i'm gonna we're gonna work our way down kind of in a column so the okay. first line below that is going to be positive positive i just put plus plus that means breast present uterus present and then the next line is going to be plus minus which is breast present uterus not and then the next line is going to be minus plus which means no breast but uterus present. And then the final line is going to be minus minus, which means no breasts, no uterus. Okay? Okay. Now, when you look at it like this, then you get a differential diagnosis, which we're going to put out to the right of each of these possibilities. So to the right of plus plus, we're going to be thinking about a differential diagnosis for primary amenorrhea in a patient who has breast development and on evaluation has a uterus. So it's like that outflow. differential that differential diagnosis is really very, very similar to secondary amenorrhea. Okay? So it could be pregnancy, it could be that they have hypothalamic dysfunction, that could be like the uh, female athlete triad, or it could be uh, some other hypothalamic uh, cause of amenorrhea, okay? Uh, hypothalamic hypogonadism, uh, Kalman's syndrome, another example there. Um, so again, and then we could be thinking about, we don't really think about Asherman's because if they have never had, you know, a menstrual cycle, they probably don't have a reason to have had uterine surgery. But again, as we go through the list for breast present, uterus present, it's mainly the same list that would apply to secondary amenorrhea. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, when we think of, I'm going to let you jump in here. When we think about breast present, uterus not, no uterus, what kind of diagnoses can you think of that would fit that pattern? Um, Turner syndrome. So does a patient with Turner's have a uterus? Not typically, but I guess they... Mm, I would argue they do. Oh, they have a Patients with Turner's have a uterus, but what they, what they don't have is they don't have functional gonads. So they're usually hypoestrogenic, okay? So I would put Turner's in kind of the breast not present because they usually don't have estrogen and the uterus is present. In fact, there are lots of cases of Turner's patients who get um, IVF and actually carry a pregnancy. I've had a couple of those in my practice over the years. But you're, you're on the right idea. There are some specific like diagnoses. So breast present, uterus, yeah, what'd you, what'd you say? Androgen insensitivity. Yes. Like, you know, in my mind, I always think about Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, the famous actress. 
you, you know she has androgen insensitivity or testicular feminization it's the same thing did you knew that yes yeah perfect so that's a great one for breast present uterus not and then for breast not present uterus is present we could say turners and i'm just giving these as examples and then what about no breast no uterus um no breast no uterus um Would that be, would Swire syndrome fall under that? Uh, you know, I, this is always going to be like chromosomal kind of things. It's going to be, and I can't remember if Swire's is one of them. I'm going to have to actually look that up. Okay. Um, it's the most, it's the least common. Okay. But this is usually going to be some kind of chromosomal abnormality. Okay. Um, so again, if you kind of go through this, four different combinations, I think it helps you to remember what the different differential diagnoses are. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't been through this exercise in my mind in a while. And mm -hmm. if I, I feel stupid because I saw in your cases, oh, we got to, you know, talk about this. And then as I got further into it, I'm like, okay, I haven't looked at this in a while either. <laughs> but um, again, I think it's, we, we, we've covered multiple different things. And, you know, it's not as hard when you kind of put a framework around it like that. Let's get back to your patient for just a second. Mm -hmm. You, um, in this particular case, it looks like you did really uh, just an evaluation for, well, let me ask you, what did you do in this case for infertility evaluation? Because on paper, I'm not sure if I know. So tell mm -hmm. me, what did you do for infertility evaluation? Um, so for her infertility, I did, like I said, a history and physical. Um, I did a pelvic exam as well as an ultrasound. Um, and she hadn't had a menses for several months. And so we started with her oligomenorrhea um, and did a progesterone challenge just to make sure that she was able to have a withdrawal bleed. Um, and then... Does the withdrawal bleed indicate that she's ovulatory? It doesn't indicate that she's ovulatory, but it does indicate that she is estrogen on board. Okay, so it tells us that she has estrogen present, but it doesn't really tell us anything about fertility or ovulatory status, does it? No. Okay, so what else did you do regarding her infertility as far as evaluating it? Um, I just, with my evaluation, um, discussed her partner's history to see if he had any um, children um, and encouraged her to evaluate him for a semen analysis as well. Um, the plan Okay, was, so you recommended, you recommended a semen analysis? Mm -hmm. The plan was to um, follow up with the ultrasound to see if there was any structural um, cause of her infertility. Um, but she actually, um, after following up with her, they are not trying to get pregnant any longer. <laughs> when you, okay, when you say an ultrasound to look for structural abnormalities related to her infertility, what mm -hmm. structural abnormalities are you talking about? Um, I was looking to see if she had, um, a normal uterus, um, as well as any fibroids or polyps present. Okay. Now, are fibroids and polyps a common cause of infertility? Uh, not typically, but if she, you know, it, just to see. What structural, what, what structural problems are a common cause of infertility? Uh, septate uterus or... Um, so, so does a septate uterus make it hard for somebody to get pregnant? Um, how you're asking the question, no. It's usually maintaining a pregnancy. I would agree. I think of septate uterus as more commonly associated with early pregnancy loss than I do with difficulty actually conceiving. So what kind of structural anomaly is associated with difficulty conceiving? Um, hmm. I guess if you have like a unicorn uterus or a even possibly a didelphus. Okay. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I think as I'm listening to you, you're focusing only on the uterus. Mm. But I'm thinking about beyond the uterus. What am okay. I thinking about? 
So like adhesions or um, history of prior infection in her tube? Yeah, I'm thinking about the fallopian tubes. When I think about infertility, now granted, mullerian anomalies may be associated. A unicorn in uterus, for one thing, would only have one fallopian tube in a lot of cases. Yeah. So, but, but I'm thinking of tubal anatomy. When you think about evaluating for a structural cause of infertility, I'm thinking there could be, could there be something going on with the tubes? It could be either congenital or acquired. We think about acquired because things like pelvic infections or endometriosis with adhesions are commonly implicated. So does your pelvic ultrasound evaluate tubal factor infertility? No, not typically. What studies would you have to do or what studies could you do to evaluate for tubal factor? Um, we would typically do an um, HSG or uh, a chromosivation in the operating room. Um, and I was made aware recently that there's another newer technology out where there's an inpatient or um, outpatient procedure that you can do in the office under ultrasound. Yes, so those would be the three. HSG where you put dye under um, fluoroscopic evaluation and watch dye go through the uterus and the fallopian tubes and spill into the peritoneal cavity. Chromatobation, where you're visualizing directly under laparoscopy, the same kind of situation. And then ultrasound with agitation of air bubbles uh, up through the fallopian tubes, which is a newer technique that some people are, some people aren't doing. Okay, so good. Now, beyond tubal factor and male factor, what other evaluation would you do for a patient for infertility? Ovulatory factor, you would try to see if the patient was um, ovulating at all. And what is your preferred test for that? Um, well, initially trying to get a history to see if they're having regular menses, that's typically a good indication that they are ovulating. Um, but then if they, um, you can do a 21 day progesterone level um, to see if they ovulated. Now, are you looking for the day 21 progesterone to be elevated or low? For it to be elevated. Okay, good. So I would agree, history can often be predictive, um, especially if the patient has regular menses with associated symptoms of ovulation. In this case, the patient doesn't have regular menses, so perhaps the day 21 progesterone would be appropriate. Uh, that would be my favorite test, looking to see if the patient has evidence of ovulation. Just her oligomenorrhea alone is an indicator of at least intermittent anovulation. Right. Um, I want to ask you, for this patient, if she had come back to you desiring to conceive, and if the only factor you identified was potentially ovulation, how would you have managed her? I would have started her on ovulation induction with typically letrozole. Now, letrozole, how does that work? It is a progesterone receptor modulator, I guess. It has, oh, I need to look this up, but um, um, it has a higher affinity, I believe, for the progesterone receptor. Okay. Now, um, Clomid is also used for ovulation induction. Do you ever use that? I did in residency. Okay. And why do you use letrozole instead of Clomid? Um, I guess studies have showed that, and I know we're not supposed to say studies have showed, but that uh, letrozole has been more successful with ovulation induction with lesser side effects than Clomid. Okay. So both of these are options, clomiphene or letrozole. Um, I think where letrozole has definitely been shown to be more successful is in patients, for instance, with PCOS, mm -hmm. um, definitely there. Letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor and clomiphene is actually a CIRM, okay? okay. Uh, and I would definitely look at both of those medications, not just you, but everybody listening and look at the mechanism of action and how do they actually induce ovulation? Because I know that is a reasonably common question in the exam. Um, also, you should be prepared to talk about, you know, how long would you treat a patient with ovulation induction before you would consider that it's been a failure and they mm -hmm. need to move on to REI? Do you have any 
any kind of internal feeling about that in your practice? Um, I typically offer three cycles, depending on the patient's age with the patient, and then um, refer them to REI, but I'm under the impression that you could potentially do more, probably up to five or six, and then. Good, and that's the usual window, three to six months. And as you mentioned, the age of the patient would obviously impact that. Um, the older the patient is, the quicker you're gonna move them on to REI. In fact, to be honest, for patients that are in their late 30s or beyond, you might not even, you might send them to REI right off, uh, right off the bat. Um, with ovulation induction, is there anything you can add to it to increase the chance of the patient getting pregnant? Um, I know that they're, depending on patients um, and whether or not they have like a pre-diabetic or diabetic, we can also add metformin. Okay, does metformin increase the chance of conceiving? I would like to say yes, but I need to look into that a little bit further. Okay, uh, can you think of anything else that might be helpful? Um, not that I do in my office, so not at this time. Oh, okay, what about something you don't do in your office? <laughs> what um, were you thinking of? I wasn't thinking of anything, to be honest. Oh, okay, so here's the thing. Um, with ovulation induction, I believe that it is still true that there are uh, increased chance of conception if you combine it with intrauterine insemination. Oh, okay. Okay. Which doesn't is not meaning that there's a sperm donor. You can do intrauterine insemination, obviously, with the partner's sperm. And so a lot of infertility clinics, if they're doing ovulation induction, will combine it with intrauterine insemination. Um, the other thing that... Uh, you mentioned, uh, you said uh, metformin. Oh yeah, that's a good point. There was a period of time where metformin was looked at for possibly improving um, ovulation induction. I think that the feeling now is that metformin doesn't really work as an ovulation induction agent, but optimizing metabolic problems like associated with PCOS or prediabetes that's really the role of metformin. And so you might start metformin in a patient who's gonna undergo ovulation induction just for the purposes of optimizing their metabolic situation. Uh, but I don't think there's any evidence that actually increases the chance of conceiving, okay? All right, good. Uh, I'm gonna stop here. Do you have any questions for me before I let you out of the hot seat? No, I'll look over both primary amenorrhea and go to <laughs> fertility much better. Yes, yeah, well. I will too. I will too for the primary amenorrhea so that I can refresh my mind on all the different diagnoses. That little framework always helps me to get started. So, all right. Thanks, Dr. Jones. I'm going to let you out of the hot seat. Thank you. You're welcome. And I am looking for more volunteers. If we have any more volunteers. Okay, let me do this. I don't see any volunteers. I wanna know if we have any questions. If we do, I will answer any questions that we have. Okay, I'm gonna go back to Dr. Pham because we went pretty fast. Are you there, Dr. Pham? Yes, um, I'm actually I'm a volunteer. I'm a, you are volunteering, right? Yes. Yeah, and I told you I might get back to you. I'm getting back to you, so. Let's go ahead and go back to your list. Which list do you want to look at? Um, how about gyne? And there's one case where I took out a patient's ovaries, so maybe I should practice explaining. Okay, that. which case is it? Um, it's toward, it's the his, a hysterectomy, so towards the end. Okay, let me just look here and see. Okay, so it looks like case 25. Yes. Okay, just give me one second. Let me just look at that for a second. Okay, yeah. So I could see them reasonably asking you, why did you take out, you know, kind of look across the table at you kind of sternly and say, why did you take out the ovaries in this 47-year-old? Seems mm -hmm. awfully aggressive. What would you say? 
So she has a family history of ovarian cancer in her mom um, and her maternal grandmother. Um, so she had undergone genetic testing um, and was BRCA negative. Um, however, she was found to have a slightly increased of lifetime risk of ovarian cancer um, of 6%, um, whereas the general population is about 1.4%. Um, so extensive counseling was done and ultimately she decided that she wanted her ovaries removed um, to decrease her future risk of ovarian cancer. Okay, so tell me, what was the extensive counseling, the risk benefit equation for this scenario? Yeah, so um, you know, certainly in patients with uh, increased risk of lifetime risk of ovarian cancer, like if they have um, familial history or like a genetic mutation such as BRCA um, or Lynch syndrome, then um, that would de definitely be an indication to remove the patient's ovaries. Um, and I explained this to the patient. However, she does have a family history and a slightly increased baseline risk of ovarian cancer. So taking out um, her ovaries and her fallopian tubes during the hysterectomy um, would decrease to potential sources of ovarian cancer. Um, she was counseled that ovarian cancer could still potentially um, arise from her peritoneum. Um, in terms of the uh, risk associated with um, removing her ovaries early premenopausally, um, her risk of all-cause um, mortality increases. Um, that can be mitigated with hormone replacement therapy. Um, however, that does come with its own risks and benefits. Um, in terms of not having a uterus anymore, she would only need to be on estrogen uh, therapy and would not need progesterone. Um, and while estrogen can help with, um, you know, surgical menopause symptoms um, and bone health and um, decrease her risk of colon cancer, um, it does come with increased risk of um, venous thromboembolism as well. Now, I'm sorry, the risk of venous thromboembolism, you're talking about with hormone replacement therapy? Yes. Sorry, okay, the, right. uh, sorry the conversation about like removing her ovaries kind of led into hormone yes, replacement. Yes, got it. Got it. Okay, now I want to ask you this. You mentioned that because she had, did you say two first degree relatives with ovarian cancer? Uh, her, I think, so her mom, but I think grandmother would be second degree, right? Okay, so yeah, but two, two relatives with ovarian cancer, you said approximately 6%. Yes. And you said, baseline risk approximately 1%. Yes. I agree with both of those numbers. What would you say if she had one first degree relative, say just her mom, but not a grandmother? What would you say her risk is? Do you have any idea? Mm, somewhere in between that, but no, yeah, I don't. I would know. agree. The number that it comes to my mind is like four to 5%. So, so the risk with one for ovarian cancer is a pretty significant increase, more than doubles the risk, and having two, then even slightly more increases the risk, but still well below a patient who has, for instance, a BRCA mutation, mm -hmm. which would be approximately how much risk? If you have a BRCA mutation, what's the risk of ovarian cancer? Uh, I think the lifetime risk is 70 percent for one and I want to say 40 percent for two but I would need to go back and look that up okay so for ovarian cancer I think when you look this up you'll see that for one it's approximately 40 percent and for okay. two it's approximately 20 percent okay. okay so certainly what we're talking about all this conversation so far has been genetic factors family uh -huh. history or a mutation what are some other risk factors associated with ovarian cancer? Um, so she is a NOLAP. Um, she's never had kids. Uh, I'm completely blanking. I know like OCPs decrease the risk. Um, okay, let me mention this. So yeah. Being nulliparous, 
you're saying potentially increases the risk, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And OCPs potentially decrease the risk, right? And ovulation. So yeah, I always think about ovulatory function kind of increases the risk and not ovulating decreases the risk. So for mm -hmm. instance, a couple of things that, that are commonly associated, if you have early menarche or very oh, yeah. late menopause, which would okay. give you a much longer reproductive lifespan, those are potentially risk factors. So I agree with all these things you've mentioned so far. Anything mm -hmm. else? Anything else that you can think of that increases the risk? Mm, I believe smoking increases her risk. Um, those are the only things I can think of at this time. So smoking is one I would have to look up to see how strong the association is. Uh, I know it's associated with so many things, it wouldn't surprise me. The thing I was thinking about that we hadn't mentioned yet was advancing age. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because, yes. Because right, ovarian cancer is usually a disease of like the sixth decade. I think, right. the, um, I think the average onset is in the 60s. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, let me ask you this. Slightly different question. Um, when we think about ovarian cancer and how it compares as far as on the list of most common cancers, mm -hmm. uh, is ovarian cancer the most common gynecologic cancer in the United States? No, it's endometrial cancer. What is, what is the most common? Endometrial. Okay. And is ovarian second most common gynecologic cancer in the United States? Um... Are you including, well, you're not including breasts in this conversation, right? No, I'm not. No, I'm talking okay. about, gyne yes, I'm, I'm not uh, including breasts. Pelvic okay. gynecologic cancer, how about that? I think it would be second in the United okay, States. Okay, I would agree. Ovarian cancer is second in the United States. Now, when we, if we said worldwide, would that list change? Yes, it would be cervical cancer. Would be second. Um, I would guess that cervical cancer would be number one in the world, would be my guess. So actually, yes, um, thinking about that for a second, you'd be right. In the world, cervical cancer would be number one, uterine cancer would be number two, ovarian would be number three. In the United States, ovarian would be number two and uterine would be number one because cervical cancer is relatively rare. Um, and one last question on this. Uh, when we think about the, oh, well, I'm gonna give one thing away, which is when we think about the likelihood of death from cancer, ovarian cancer would be the most likely gynecologic cancer for a woman to die of in the United States, okay? Uh -huh. Where does it rank? on the causes of cancer death for women overall. So we include all other kinds of cancer. Where is ovarian cancer on that list? What's the number one type of cancer to cause death in women? Um, lung cancer? Yes, lung cancer. Uh, it's actually the most common cause of death in men too, lung cancer, okay? So where does ovarian cancer fall on that list? I would say, Lower. Um, is it in the top 10? Yes, I would think so. It is. It is. Is it in the top five? Mm -hmm. You saying yes? Yes, I would agree with that. Oh. Like, I'm okay, thinking of you, uh, lung, breast, uh, and ovarian cancer. I just don't know, like, how bad it would be in terms of ranking where they, like, fall in relation to each other besides the lung cancer. Okay, good. So lung would be number one, breast would be number two mm -hmm. for causes of cancer death. Okay, I'm, I'm actually giving you the answer here. Colon okay. would be number three. Okay. And believe it or not, pancreatic cancer would actually be number four. It edges out ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is number five for okay. cancer death for women in the United States. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the reason I got into those statistics is that knowing the, where ovarian cancer ranks mm -hmm. kind of makes this case um, not seems such, like such a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. Because 
while ovarian cancer is relatively uncommon, it's, it's a significant issue when it occurs, and this patient's family history does elevate her risk above the baseline population, although not as high as BRCA. So this is, I think, a reasonable shared decision-making process um, where if a patient didn't have any family history at all, and in fact had no risk factors at all, then we could argue that, that the risk of ovarian cancer is probably not significant enough to justify removing her ovaries at age 47. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Now, yes. obviously, a patient has the final word, but the point I'm making here is I, I, I think you were concerned about this cancer, this case, because she's young and you took out her ovaries. And I yeah. think that's a good concern. And I think that the discussion here would be an easy one to convince the examiners um, that it's completely reasonable. And so okay. I'm, not, I'm not worried about it. But, but knowing okay. where ovarian cancer ranks, these are good things to know because these are the kind of things that patients will be thinking about too when they're making the decision. And, and of course, if you overstate the risk, then that's gonna potentially make the examiners less Feel like this surgery was less appropriate because you didn't know what the risks were. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Any questions for me before I let you have a hot seat? Um, just in terms of like the counseling piece of it, um, would I, would you recommend that I just like stop at the risk, talking about the risk and benefits of removing her ovaries, or should I like kind of lead into hormone replacement therapy, or just let them ask? So I think so I think one of the risks of removing her ovaries at age 47 is that she'll be very likely be symptomatic shortly after surgery. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I think it's a nice discussion to have. I think that when you talk about the risks and benefits with the patient, if the patient was telling you I will not have hormone replacement therapy, I absolutely do not want it, then mm -hmm. that would be an important point to discuss with her preoperatively so that you know, she would have full informed consent. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I like, I like it. Awesome. All right, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Good job. I'm going to let you have a hot seat. Nice case. Uh, looking at the time, uh, got a little carried away. We're a few minutes over. Uh, anybody with any questions before we wrap up for tonight? Okay, not seeing any. I'm gonna go ahead and end the webinar for tonight. We will have a structured case webinar tomorrow, Wednesday night, look forward to having you guys join us then. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight.